All right, I just finished watching Avatar The Last Airbender, the Netflix series, and <laughs> it messed me up so much, I immediately had to take a vacation. I just, I had to escape the country. I just, yeah, I had to escape the country. I, I couldn't handle it. Listen, uh, for those that don't know me, I am a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender, the, 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 the cartoon series, I it is my favorite TV show of all time. He's coming near my feet. Uh, this is your favorite TV show of all time. Um, I absolutely adore the show. So I was excited initially when I heard that they're making a live action version of it on Netflix with the creator's help and everything. Um, and I was initially really excited for it, only to be disappointed when about, a, I think, a year after that announcement, uh, the creators ended up leaving and uh, clearly the creators were not excited about whatever Netflix was doing. And it made me a little worried. And now that the show is out, I think I have all my answers as to possibly why the creators left, uh, what's going on, and my, my, whole, my whole entire opinion of the show as a whole. I have a lot to say. So we're going to start with episode one and take it from there. So it starts with uh, this Earthbender recon mission, I guess, uh, you know, where they have this Earthbender in Capital City in the Fire Nation, and he finds out they're gonna start a war. And and, and honestly, I think that's fine. I think that that's totally fine. Uh, that's an example of a change I come to expect in an adaptation. That's num the number one thing I wanna mention is that I expected there to be changes, but those changes have to make sense. And that is something I will say regarding the show is a lot of the changes they did didn't always make sense. And that's what really bothered me. Um, but this is an example of a change where, yeah, sure. OK, an Earthbender was there. They find out about the war. Uh, they go to warn the Earth Kingdom. But the Fire Nation was never planning to attack the Earth Kingdom. That was a ploy because they want to really attack the Airbenders. Because this is 100 years ago before Aang and the gang and all that stuff. And Sozin's comment is there. And one of the first things I noticed in this episode was that there was this, this the intro, like they do with, with, like with the cartoon show, Earth, Fire, Air, Water, you know what I mean? They, it, it, looked, it looked meh because... It was like CGI people. And that's something this show does a lot, by the way. There's a whole lot of CGI people. It never looks good whenever there's CGI people. You could just tell immediately it's CGI people. This doesn't say the CGI in the show is bad. I think it's pretty good overall. But a lot of times they'll have these like CGI versions of the characters and it never looks that great. I don't really know how to feel about about that. Uh, but they had that intro and then we look, we get into Ink's past. And this is a clip that kind of went viral where Aang is like flying or it looks like Aang is like flying around. It looks like he's flying around like Zaheer and Korra. And I'll be honest, it definitely looks a bit weird, but I did give it a little bit of a pass because unlike the cartoon, when you're translating airbending into live action, you're not really going to be seeing a lot of air. You're not going to be looking at air. You know what I mean? In the cartoon, you're literally seeing cartoon version of air, but in live action. So I understood like he's, he's, He's airbending. He's not necessarily flying, he's airbending. I'll give the show a pass on that. Did it look funky? Absolutely. It should have been made better. So he's just, he's flying. <laughs> but I'll give the show a pass on that one. <laughs> this is where we get the genocide of the airbenders. Again, this is another example of a change they made to the show. And this is where you also uh, come to find out that the show is not like a cartoon. It's not like trying to be like how the original uh, cartoon was. Uh, in fact, you actually got this with the Earthbender Recon because he ends up dying. He burns alive. It's very, it's very gory. It's very graphic. Uh, they're, they're going for more of an adult type theme here. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. But what I'm... The cartoon version of the show didn't do that. And... I feel like the point still got across. It was still very powerful. You still felt for the characters um, without the need of all the gore and the graphic and all this stuff. Um, do, do I hate that they included it? No, I think that's fine. In fact, me being able to finally see what the genocide looked like of the Air Nation, I think that's cool. But I, I'll go into more why that's a problem for me overall with, with, with the... Uh, 
the direction this show decided to take here. And you guys might notice so far, I keep on comparing it to the original cartoon series. I I, I, I can't help myself because I'm a hardcore fan, but the show is also called Avatar The Last Airbender. It has all the characters from Avatar The Last Airbender. So if it wanted to be something completely different, it would have just made its own show. You know what I mean? So I feel like comparing it to the original, I feel like that's all we can do. You know what I mean? This is where Aang learns that he's the Avatar. And unlike the original cartoon, he doesn't decide to run away. He decided to just take a ride on Appa randomly during a storm to clear his head. To, 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 to. He, he said, oh, yeah, I want to ride into the sky where I could really think about this. And it's like, that's an example of a change that's really unnecessary, but it also just comes off to me as more unrealistic. I feel like the cartoons writing is more realistic. It's a 12 year old boy that just learned he's destined to have to save the world and he doesn't know how to handle it and he decides to run away because he doesn't want to deal with it. That's more believable to me than Aang deciding to randomly take a trip on Appa in the middle of the night during a thunderstorm, which by the way, yeah, like the same stuff happens that happens in the cartoon. A big storm comes in, he gets swallowed under this big wave, he goes into the iceberg. But it's like, Aang was running away in the cartoon, so him getting caught up in a storm that he didn't expect makes sense, but he had every choice not to fly this day in this version of the cartoon. He didn't have to fly, he just chose to. He even says, oh, Appa, I think we should head back. You think? It's getting kind of rough, Appa. Maybe we should head back home. You're in the middle of a hurricane, dude. It's just unrealistic, unrealistic writing. But yeah, Aang didn't run away. I don't really like that. He goes into the iceberg, all that stuff. You know, you get you get the whole Sokka, Katara introduction. The iceberg breaks from Katara just waterbending next to it randomly. There's no like thing that happens that causes the iceberg to break. Katara just ends up waterbending kind of in its vicinity, making it break. And it's just like, again, it's not, it, it, how is the cartoon more realistic with its writing than this? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, Hang finds out everyone is gone in the worst way possible. Grand Gran is an asshole. <laughs> uh, by the way, I am so freaking hot. I'm gonna freaking take this off. I'm like burning up. The, the way Grand Gran tells Aang that he's the last airbender on earth was to recite the intro, which by the way, if you guys remember, I just mentioned that we had the original intro a little bit ago. We did. The show has two. We have it. very odd choice to have two of them. It's just, is weird to me. But Grand Grand just recites the original intro and that's how she tells Aang that he's alone. And it just felt so unrealistic. It felt incredibly random. It also felt rude. The Southern Air Temple. Where the Air Nomads live? Well, not all the Air Nomads, but most of them had just arrived for the Great Comet Festival. The Great Comet Festival. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. <laughs> Only the Avatar, master of all four elements. Everyone in the village knows this story, but you don't. Just as you don't know that airbenders haven't been seen in generations and that the Southern Air Temple was the first to fall. That's because how you drop it on them? in that ice this whole time. Well, that's just... He may seem like just a boy, but he's much more. He is the last airbender. Yeah, we got that. <laughs> Wait, she did that was so wrong. Yeah. So wrong. What the heck? That didn't seem realistic at all. It also felt like that's how you're gonna tell this boy, this 12 year old boy that he's alone, all those people are dead. It just didn't, it, I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. I didn't understand it. But it, right after that too, Aang is like thinking about the fact that he's alone now. He's like sad on top of a roof. You know what I mean? He's like sitting like this, like all sad. And Katara, this is where you get to see how bad of an actor Katara is. And I'm really sorry to say that, Katara is the worst part of the show, both her character and the actor that plays her. Aang literally mentions that he's all alone and the Katara actor literally goes, I'm sorry. All my friends, everyone I know, 
They're all gone. I'm... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. D the guitar actor cannot show emotion. They has she has no emotion in this. It's it's so annoying. He got the Fire Nation ship after they take Aang. This is another example of the writers not really understanding that they're already contradicting themselves. Because in the first episode, we see him kind of like flying in a way, like using airbending to kind of maneuver himself in midair, essentially flying, but not in the way people were saying it. He's flying online. But you see him like falling when he doesn't have his glider. It's like, why are you why are you panicking? You can save yourself by airbending. I don't know. Just this, another example of the writing not really being clear sometimes. Katara here, after they save him, Katara waterbended from like 2,000 feet in the air, about as higher than where I am now, actually. She was like, they were super high into the sky on Appa. Zuko shoots these fireballs at them, and she waterbended this giant wave from 2,000 feet in the air and stops the water. Guys, we didn't see Katara's improvement at all with waterbending. All Aang did tell her in that time period was to like focus on balancing herself, like some, some, something like super corny. And immediately she's just a master. Within the first episode, she's already waterbending these huge things. It's like, dude, the writing is not more realistic than the cartoon. How did you manage that? How in the live action version of Avatar did you make the writing more unrealistic? They didn't really care about the characters developing their bending, developing their powers. That was a major part of the cartoon. That really bummed me out when I realized that. And then after they save Aang, they go straight to the Southern Air Temple where Aang, you know, grew up. And you get the Avatar State where Katara is like, you know, you know, to bring Aang out of the Avatar State like in the cartoon, she does the same thing. Aang, we're family now. All that stuff. But we didn't see them really interact in the cartoon. They went penguin sledding, you know. Aang clearly already likes her. He literally admitted that to Appa. He he thinks she's, you know, cute. And, and, and they had time to, to get to know each other. But in this version, they really didn't. They didn't really talk that much. They didn't hang out that much. It just felt rushed. It, it didn't really make any sense. But regarding episode one, let me talk about the good and bad. The good is the action. There's good action and, and showing more of the original story, which is what I want from this adaptation. Take the story that's there and just add to it. You don't have to change it too much just add to it give us something new here that we couldn't get in the cartoon um i like them showing like the genocide i i liked that i like them showing more of what we get to expect in this original story and i liked the action but the bad parts the acting the katara actor uh Sokka's actor is pretty good uh katara's actor is horrible ang's actor is okay-ish cgi shots looked super funky at times uh, just having like CGI versions of the character, especially Aang. They have CGI versions of Aang all the time whenever they can't make a live action version of him doing some sort of move. They have a CGI version of him and it doesn't look good. There's so much exposition. Oh my God. And this is going to be throughout the entire show. They just have exposition, 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 throw it at you. They don't show anything. They just do it in word vomit form. It's, it's not great. Rather than telling Aang and having a flashback to the genocide at that moment, they just have Grand Grand recite the intro in exposition form. That's how she tells him. Uh, Katara's I'm sorry, which is it's just the acting. It's just bad. It's bad. So let's just jump to episode two. This is where they find Momo at the Southern Air Temple. Uh, Katara gets her waterbending scroll. Uh, she got it from Grand Grand this time. She just had it this whole time. And this is the part that really, really pisses me off the most about this show. Katara doesn't learn waterbending with A. In fact, Aang throughout this entire show never bends water in and of itself. He goes into the Avatar state and all that stuff, but he never actually bends water himself. And this stupid freaking scroll is how Katara learns waterbending in its entirety. This is how she becomes a master. She doesn't learn waterbending from anyone else in this show because the, the writers in this show already made Katara perfect. No character flaws, no character development. She just gets the scroll from Grand Grand that Grand Grand had all this time and Katara's perfect now. She could just look at the scroll, study it. Aang and Katara never bond. They never they never try to learn water bending together. And she learns way too quick. And it just, oh my God. How is this, how is, I gotta ask the people that defend this version of the show. 
How is this a genuine improvement from the original? I don't see it. I don't see how this is a genuine improvement. It's not. They arrive to Kiyoshi Island. The statue gives Aang, uh, gives a sign that Aang's avatar by literally glowing its eyes at Aang, which is wild. The Kyoshi warriors at first didn't believe that Aang was, you know, the avatar. And it's like, again, more unrealistic writing compared to the cartoon. In the cartoon, they believed him because he's an airbender. He's airbending. So they believe, oh God, he must be the avatar. He's airbending. They're, airbenders are supposed to be extinct. The avatar disappeared as an airbender. This must be the avatar. That's realistic writing. In this show, the, the airbending wasn't even enough. They didn't believe he was he was the avatar, even at him being an airbender. It wasn't until Kiyoshi had her glowing red, glowing eyes at him that they believe it. It's like, really? This another example of the writing not being better than the original, not being an improvement. It's a downgrade, uh, and and an unnecessary change at that too. It's not that like they had to make a change and it had to be this way. No, some writer in the writer's room changed it for no reason and they just made this mess it's like i i don't get it sock and suki still grow their relationship but it's not as charming as the original but it's still not bad it's really not and that's a good i will give this episode but the bad in this episode sokka doesn't get much of a character arc at all and i know this is a bit controversial uh that people talked about it online uh but they took away sokka's you know sexism sexism uh his sexist tendencies from the original as someone who advocates for, you know, you know, people being treated equally and all that stuff, I think the best way to educate people on a subject matter as horrible as, you know, sexism or, you know, anything like that is show a character their flaws and have them learn from it. Because that's realistic. That's real world. That that makes more sense to me. This this Sokka doesn't have any character flaws. He has zero character flaws. At least I didn't notice any. Um, and if he does, it's not nearly as severe as the cartoon. But in that interview, when they announced that, that Sokka's not going to have his sexist comments, is the way, when they announced it in the interview, it made it sound like the, the writers of this show, this version of the show, misunderstood you know, Sokka's character from the original show, and that's what makes me mad. Is They, they made it sound like Sokka is just sexist to be sexist. It's like that's not the point at all. He was he was sexist because of uh, his environment, how how he was raised by these waterbenders who have this belief that women can't fight. But he learns that that's not true in and of itself, and he advocates for 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 Katara to fight and all that stuff with Paku in the north, and and, and for in for Suki, and he just th that never happens. And by omitting that, I feel like you're actually causing more damage to that message because that message never really gets across now. Again, I feel like the best way to educate people on a very, on a real world problem is to show a character their flaws and have them learn from it. That's realistic, that's that's growth, and that shows the viewer who may believe that nonsense that it's not right. And I think the original creators did a great job of doing that in the cartoon. It was a great message, and I grew up on the show and it, it taught me that message well. If a kid was watching this version, that's never gonna cross their mind. I feel like that message is more important now more than ever. And the fact that these writers decided to omit that, I think it was actually really careless on their part. Uh, the dialogue is not great. Uh, in fact, the writers made Suki in this version seem kind of, she seems stuck up in a way. Um, because at one point Sokka says, oh, you're a warrior just like me. And Suki gets mad at Sokka and says, no, I'm not a warrior. I'm a Kiyoshi warrior. We have a lot in common. We're both warriors, right? Before she died, Avatar Kiyoshi trained an elite force in her image, one ready to protect not only our homes, but our way of life. That tradition has been passed down through the generations, and it is now my honor to protect this community and to uphold the values of the Avatar. That is why I'm not just a warrior. I'm a Kiyoshi warrior. In the original show, that happened when he was making sexist comics to comments toward her. She said, I'm not just a girl, I'm a warrior too. In this show, she's mad that he called her a warrior and not a Kiyoshi warrior. 
Make the changes make sense. You're not helping your message. These writers don't know what they're doing. And that's, that's what made me mad. It's like, you omit the sexism, you omit the educational aspect of it all, but then you, you make Suki come off as like rude and like ungrateful and snobby a little bit. And it's like, I don't like that at all. Episode three. This is when uh, Azula tricks some freedom fighters in Capital City. They were gonna take out the Fire Lord and Azula tricks them and you know, they die a horrible death. And that's when Zuko, uh, Azula finds out that Zuko is actually uh, hunting the Avatar and he, he found him. And Azula gets mad at this and jealous. And I don't hate this aspect of the show that they're kind of, they reveal Azuka early on, um, but they also have her develop this anger towards Zuko and, and her father using Zuko as a, hunting the after as a ploy to make Azula stronger. Was it necessary? No. Do I hate it? No, I don't hate it at all. I think that's actually a, an example of it. Another change adding to the original, and I think that's fine. I think that's fine. This episode combines like four episodes from the original into one, and I don't think it hit the way the writers thought it was going to hit. I just don't think it, it, was, it was that great. Jet and his freedom fighters, you know, they're fine. You know, you get the Northern Air Temple, uh, episode with the, the mechanic, but we're not the Northern Air Temple, we're in Omashu. You got the waterbending scroll and you have the King of Omashu episode. These are all one combined thing in this one episode and it's just like, wow. Okay, we'll see how they do it. Uh, Omashu has like this bombing problem, which is like, whatever, sure. Uh, Azula, May, and Tai Li are discussing Zuko being first in line to be a Fire Lord, which I'm happy they're talking about that. It wasn't really uh, explained much in the show, but um, May and Ty Lee. I think Ty Lee's actor looks fine. May's actor doesn't really look like Ty Lee at all. I gotta be honest with you, I saw fan castings that did a better job. Uh, the casting for Azula, I think is okay. The the director being doing a good job with the actor trying to make her act like Azula, but she just, I don't know. I feel like they probably could have casted someone slightly better for Azula. I'll have to see more of her. I hope she develops more along with the character. I, there's one thing in this episode that really bothered me. It's the part where Katara is like defending Jet and Aang and Sokka are defending Sai, the mechanist. We get this, <laughs> in a one minute sequence, we get this like Bollywood ass looking shot of Zuko like with Katara's like hair thing. And it's like, he like grabs it. It's such a weird shot. It made no sense whatsoever. It was completely unnecessary. And one minute later, Katara comes back to Sokka and Aang is like, you guys were right. And it's like, what was the, what was the point of that? Like, like I know in the cartoon, we had something similar to that with Jet and the crew where between Sokka versus Katara and Aang, but in this version, it just seems so like rushed and unrealistic again. And it didn't, it didn't hit the way they thought it did. This part's a little weird. So I, I Aang took Zuko's book, Avatar book. And I don't hate that he took that. I think that's again, expanding on the original writing, that's fine. But Zuko just, revealing that he's a firebender in the middle of Omashu, it just made Zuko, I feel like, be a bit more care, like careless and dumber than he is in the cartoon. It just, it, it, I don't believe for a second Zuko would actually start firebending at Aang in the middle of Omashu because he gets angry. Uh, it just, it's just insane. I don't, I don't imagine Zuko really doing that at all. Uh, Katara ends up saving the king with this really weird water shot. It's, it's whatever. Uh, you know, they saved the king from this, uh, Ploy from Jet's crew to assassinate him. And so the good in this episode is Saga gets inspiration from the mechanist being more like an engineer, and I like that. They're expanding on the original show. I love that. But the bad is we lose the story of the Northern Air Temple. Uh, and I hate that because that was an episode where Aang has to really come to terms with the fact that he's the last airbender and history's kind of erasing him. And that kind of messes with you a bit, but they didn't really explore that here at all. The scene where Katara, there's a scene here there's a scene where Katara splashes herself with water and the effect looks so bad. She stayed dry, by the way. She was like dry. I'll show the shot here. What? Didn't get wet? She got wet. <laughs> she was dry as a bone. But let's, let's jump to episode four. Aang and Iroh are in jail after the whole Mashu fight. And I like that uh, conversation between Hing and Iroh. It's again, another example of expanding on the original show. And, and I liked that conversation. This is where you get Aang and Boomy. And oh my God, what did they do to Boomy? What did they do to Boomy? Boomy is 
obnoxious, not in a charming way like in the original, but in an obnoxious, like annoying way here. First off, Aang immediately finds out that's Bumi, like his friend. Like, like it's not at all like in the cartoon where he had to figure it out on his own. Um, Bumi gets mad at Aang essentially for leaving all these years. And I guess that's realistic to some sense, but it just, I, the Bumi in the original show was so charming. It was, it was like, and he was also hilarious. This one's not at all. It was just, it was just, he was just obnoxious in this one. And so he does these tests for Aang, but it, they don't really have an exact like meaning behind them. Like in the cartoon, the cartoon, the whole point of the test was for Aang to think outside the box like they did when they were kids. So the writing came full circle with them being kids. Not in this one. The tests don't really make any sense. There was no real conclusion with the tests. They were just kind of like, oh, what are you going to do, Aang? You're going to let this boulder fall on me or fall on you? It's like how I had to choose all these years when you were gone, whether to give the military food or give it to the civilians. It's like, it's not hitting the way you think it is, writers. It's really not. You get the secret tunnel episode in this with Sokka and Katara and not Aang and Katara. The writers in this show really don't want Aang and Katara to be together, and you can tell. You can just tell. They're, you can tell they're just, they're not. They're not doing that. They're not doing that. Which is like weird. I don't know why they decided to go this route. Uh, you have the hippies there, which you know it's funny to ask the cartoon. They're, they're pretty good. Um, and and this is where you know Katara and Sokka they fight like siblings in, in the tunnels. It's like man. you get Iroh and the Earthbender because Iroh's arrested. So you get this conversation with Iroh and this Earthbender that's taking him to the pit, this prison or whatever, where they're gonna execute Iroh. They're gonna kill him. Um, and he the 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 guard mentions to Iroh that his brother died in the siege of Bashing Se, and he says, like, I could still smell, smell smoke at night when I go to sleep. And I love that. I love that writing. That, that, that's, again, expanding on the original, giving the people that didn't really have a side of the story in the original more of a side of the story here, giving it heart. I, I liked that. And I liked reminding the viewer that as much as we love Iroh, Iroh was once not a great dude. Um, and honing in on that here was really great. And here you also get the Luten flashback and you get, you know, Zuko telling Iroh uh, that Luten gave him this, you know, medal uh, and it belongs to someone destined to do great things. And he gave it to Iroh, he gave it back to Iroh. And that's when you get Leaves from the Vine playing in that scene. And it was very heartwarming. I got choked up there, loved that scene. It was very powerful. And again, another example of a good change because I don't think we, we would get like a Tales of Bossing Say episode. Uh, in this version of the show, so doing it here, I guess, is fine enough. Um, it was heartwarming. I really like that. Zuko saves Iroh. You know what I mean? The general, the, one of the Earthbenders stabs Iroh when he gives him mercy, but nothing ever comes of that. Like Iroh literally gets a knife in the back, but nothing ever comes of that. It was just weird. Okay, <laughs> it's just it's another example. Writers just do something and they just move on, right? Um, Sokka and Katara get chased by badger moles here, but it doesn't attack them because they sense love. Which is so weird, because in the original, the badger moles reacted to sound, so they played with the band, those hippies. And and, and it makes sense, because they're blind, they're moles. So they react to sound, that makes sense. But in this version, they react to sensing love. <sighs> Explain to me how that writing is better than the original, or more realistic, or more believable. It's not, it's none of those things. Love is brightest in the dark. It wasn't about the crystals. That's not what guided Oma and Shu through the mountain. It's blind. They don't navigate by sight, but by feeling. They sense feelings and react to them. Anger, fear, but mostly love. Love is brightest in the dark. So they respond to love? How do you think they do with verbal commands? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Badgermole. Uh, we'd really appreciate if you could show us the way to the palace. Please. You're telling me that writing makes more sense than a mole being able to understand sound over sight? But they feel love. Your writing is shit. 
They save Aang from Boomy, who wouldn't help Aang with the falling rocks, by like icing the floor and Sokka like slides on the ice and then tackles Boomy. It was such a weird shot. I, I don't know how to feel about that, honestly. It was just so odd. And I swear the writing with Boomy is how the writers felt about the entire original show. Uh, like, because Boomy's whole mentality in this episode is, who has time to play games, Aang? That's essentially Boomy's entire thing in this episode is, who has time to play games. That, that to me is how I feel like the writers of this show are because the characters are not having any fun. There's no fun. There's no riding penguins. There's no uh, riding the, the fish in Kyoshi Island, nothing. There's no fun here whatsoever. And Boomy this whole episode is just like, who has time to have fun when there's a war? So it's like, dude, the writers, I feel like, th like that right there is just how the writers feel about the show in and of itself. Compared to the original, the test that Boomy gives Aang, like I mentioned, they don't really have a clear reason. The OG wants to think outside of the box. This one is literally like, you can't rely on anyone. It's like, that's so dumb. It's not a good, it's not good writing. It's not a good uh, a conclusion to these tests whatsoever. Katara in this episode is constantly pestering Sokka in the tunnels for no reason. And it's almost like the roles in this episode, you could see where it was reversed, where Sokka used to be of the obnoxious wasn't in the original, but for some reason they gave that to Katara. She, Sokka was more cheery than Katara in this show, which is so odd to me why th this is even a thing. That's just so odd. It's just not only is her acting bad, but it's like the writing makes her unlikable. And it's like, what was your goal with this character? Because it feels like the writer's goal was to make people hate Katara. And it's just like, I don't understand that whatsoever. So now we got episode five uh, with the forest being burned down, you know, people disappearing from the, the, the village. In the forest area, so, so this is what's weird, right, in this episode. <laughs> in, in the original, you know, Aang would go into the Avatar State for the first time, you have to go through this whole experience and run into our, our Roku's dragon and, and know where to talk to Roku, right? In this one, he accidentally brings Sokka and Katara with him into the Avatar State which is so odd. Um, and it's also weird because it's not his first time in the Avatar State, or in, in the spirit world, I mean. Because he did in Kiyoshi Island, where Kiyoshi essentially told him everything that Roku was supposed to tell him. And also, Kiyoshi in the episode was just yelling at Aang. There, there, nothing really happened in the episode. She was just yelling at Aang. And <laughs> in this one, Aang is like, oh my God, I can't bend, all that stuff. And Katara's also like, oh my God, I can't bend either. And it's like, but Aang, you were already in the spirit world. You didn't you didn't at all react to it a little bit ago, but now you are. It's just weird. Just a weird, uh, uh, you know, change that, again, doesn't make much sense here. But again, yeah, so, so Sokka and Katara go along with Aang into the spirit world, and there is no explanation about, about how they were able to do that, because you can't really do that in the original show at all. Aang, for some reason, is acting all chill about it, too. Like, Kasaka and Katara are freaking out. Like, where are we? How did we get here? And Aang is just acting so chill. It's just so odd. It's such a weird change. It doesn't make any sense. Here you get the, the, the owl from the library episode in the original here for no reason, which is really, like, I, I can't say, I don't know what to say about it. He was there for no reason. My reaction says it all. No human belongs in this room. That is one big birdie. Birdie? I am no birdie. I am... Walk it out. I'm done. I'm not done yet. I can't do this show. Thanks for coming. Hey Bai is in the spirit world, but he's not... He, we didn't really see him interact with the real world, which is the whole point of the people disappearing from the village in the first place with the burned village was because, you know, Hey Bai was mad. But you don't really see him in the in the real world. You just see him only in the spirit world, but only for a brief second too, by the way. You know, Sokka finds a talking fox. Yeah, I don't know what to think about that. Pain. Pain. So much pain. Actually, they're just scratches. Not you. Hey, bye. Hey, what? Hey, bye. That spirit. It's in a lot of pain. I must have landed harder than I thought. I'm a little discombobulated. <laughs> uh, Katara gets a vision of her mom's death. You know, that it's it's super hard to see. Sokka gets a vision of his dad being disappointed in him, which is like, again, another example of the writers making a character that was likable, like unlikable. It's like, what dad actually does that? 
Like that, like that's horrible. That's horrible. I don't believe Yokoda would actually be like that in this version, you know? Aang gets to say goodbye to Monkey Atta. So I don't know if I like this change because this gives Aang closure that he didn't already have in the original show. And the original show covers that topic of not getting closure and having to deal with loss. But this version of Aang gets that closure with Monkey Atta. He gets to say goodbye. And again, that, I feel like that just weakens the character arc. It just weakens the character. And it doesn't give the audience member something to relate to, a real world thing. People don't get closure all the time um, and having to battle that. I liked Aang forgiving himself for what happened, for him having to leave or him running away and, and that whole thing happening with the airbenders. He had to forgive himself for that and move on. And that's really powerful. But, and that's another topic that the show covered so well in the original was when you're so down on your luck, where giving yourself hope and the reason to keep going is more powerful than someone giving that to you. You actually forgiving yourself is such an important thing and such an important lesson, and this show doesn't cover that. It, this show actually gave him that closure, and it's like, Ugh. Let's talk about the good and bad here, because now I have to really go into the nuance of this episode here. I like Azula, you know, getting trying to get become perfect at what she does because of Zuko's success. But that's really the only good I could give this episode because there's a whole lot of bad. Aang was already in the spirit world in Kiyoshi Island, but for some reason acts like it's his first time in the spirit world. No reaction whatsoever. Katara literally looks like she's holding back a smile when she's about to die from Hey Bye in this episode. I'm not joking. Here's the clip. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Every time she's on screen, it looks like I'm looking at a high school play. Not good at all. There's so much exposition in this episode. They're not showing you anything. They're telling you everything, and I hate that they do that. Ko is in this episode, but he's not here to help Aang like in the original, to help them, you know, where the spirits are. He's he's literally just an obstacle in this. And it's like the, the right it's just the writing's so dull and bland. It's like it, it's just, he's just an obstacle now. And it's just like, it, it, there's also less tension there because there's no rules about not showing emotion or he'll steal your face like in the original. He, it's just, he's just an obstacle. It, it's like, it's less tense than the cartoon and that baffles me. I don't know how you managed to do that. Ko also eats people now. <laughs> uh, he, he, he takes their souls and it just seems like a random change. It didn't seem like, like, like that was needed at all. And I don't understand why they took Hey Bye story and put it on Ko. It just, it's just so random. It offered nothing and it made Hey Bai's forest burning mean absolutely nothing in the end. But let's jump to episode six now. So Zhao gets promoted, Aang goes to talk to Roku. Um, Roku acts so out of character, more goofy than in the original. It's just so random. Uh, Roku gives Aang, you know, the mother of face totem that he took from Ko which again, it seemed random. Why did he do that? They didn't really say why he did that. If they did, I maybe I missed it. But yeah, Roku took a totem from Ko in the past, but I like that it's some other faces reference. Uh, that's a reference from the, the, the comics. Uh, but Aang gets caught by June. Uh, you get Zuko's backstory saying the general's plan is terrible, burns his face off. Uh, you get the whole blue spirit part with, with Aang getting captured by Zhao. And I do gotta say, by the way, this episode here is my favorite episode in this entire live action adaptation because it is the most like the cartoon. And it's not just because it's like the cartoon, it's because they add to it. They add it to the story that was there. And that's what I expected from this adaptation. And it's so good for that. And I'll talk about the good here. Aang and, and Zuko talking after escaping. I love that. You don't really get that dynamic much in the cartoon. They're actually talking about, uh, you know, you know, they're, 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 the book, the after book, they're bonding over it, the, the brush type and all that stuff. Uh, and another good exchange that I loved them exploring is the fact that Zuko's crew is the 41st Division. Zuko essentially saved the from the Fire Nation using as bait. The Fire Nation was going to kill this crew, and that's the crew, that, that is this very crew that is, that, that's Zuko's crew now. And I love that. I love Zuko's crew being the 41st division. I think that's awesome. That's a great change. And I love that. But now we got to talk about the bad. Oh my God. The writing for Aang is so chaotic compared to the cartoon. So chaotic. 
I, I, I'm going to try to break this down as best as I can. I have it written down here. So this all started with the burned village, right? The burned down forest next to the village with Haibai. To save the villagers, he needs to go see Haibai. But then he has to save his friend from Ko after they accidentally went into the spirit world. And then to capture the, his friends from Ko, he has to go talk to Roku and the Fire Nation. Then in the in, in the process of trying to talk to Roku, Aang gets captured. And then he needs to escape to save his friends from Ko. Do you see how crazy this is? The, the simple story of having to save the villagers that are disappearing from the vi village turned into having to save his friends from Ko, turned into having to go to the Fire Nation, turned into having to escape from being in prison, all to go back just to save his friends. The, the story is just more chaotic. The writing just doesn't make as much sense. I just, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Why did Roku take the totem from Ko? Seriously, why? They never talk about that. It just seems so random. And the, the other big thing here, the other big change, Roku didn't warn Aang about the comet or anything. He, he didn't... He didn't comment about the, the comment at all. In fact, Roku barely talked in this. Roku is the avatar before Aang. You know, all of Aang's problems he's dealing with now were inherited from Roku. So the fact that they barely talk in this just seems so random, and I just don't like that. I don't like that. I don't buy that at all either. It just seems like such a random change. And again, there's more CGI character fighting in this that looks horrible. Well, let's jump to episode seven here, where the crew overhears that the guards come to arrest Zuko or whatever. It's a trick from Zhao. They, they try to kill Zuko. Um, and this is where they get to the North Pole, and they are just immediately welcomed. Uh, it's almost like they literally yell out opposite the sky, Welcome, Avatar! It's like, how did they know he was coming? That's so weird. Yue is a spirit wolf now. Sure, whatever. I, no explanation whatsoever for that. Uh, Paku tells Aang that they should he should have focused on his training on his way to the North Pole because they expected Aang to be a full-blown avatar by the time he got there, but he's not. He doesn't know anything. And P Paku literally says he should have focused on his training on the way there. And I just immediately yell facts, Paku, 100%. You're totally correct on that. It would have been wise to have focused on your training during your journey. <laughs> Thank facts! You. Thank you, Paku. <laughs> Because that's the whole time I was saying, why is Aang not trying to learn waterbending? Why is he not trying to learn with Katara? Why is Katara not trying to teach him? Like Katara literally picks up waterbending so fast while she's there. Even when she's healing in that one scene, she literally admits. You are a natural. Thanks. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. You're a waterbender. Barely. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. An otter penguin could bend more water than I could. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. Why? This is just so, you're just rounding this character. There's no, no arcs whatsoever. I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. In the original cartoon, this might be controversial. In the original cartoon, Yue was in an arranged marriage. And it, it, it talks about, the, it covers this topic where she really likes Sokka, but she was in this arranged marriage and she has to do this for her people and her, her tribe and all that stuff and their traditions. And the show kind of covers this topic about how it's kind of wrong for a person to kind of go have to deal with that, where they don't really get that freedom to choose who they get to be with. You know what I mean? It's a very real world topic. It's a very tough topic to cover in a cartoon, but they did. They managed to do that. But in this version, they UA had the power to break it off. Already, she already broke off her her marriage uh, with the guy, and to me, it just comes off as once again there is no character flaws whatsoever. Um, there's no arcs, and Yue just like Katara and Sokka, she's already perfect. She's already perfect. She she didn't need to grow or learn anything from it. She's already super powerful, and Yue is also a waterbender now too. But she had the power to break off the marriage immediately. There's no real world scenario here whatsoever. There's no storytelling there's no 
lessons to be learned. There's no education from it. There's nothing. There's nothing for the viewer to get from this other than Yue is already perfect. She had the power to break off the marriage. That's it. When Yue reveals herself to be the fox, it's literally just an exposition dump. It was just an exposition dump of her being part spirit, not really showing anything, just, you know, talking about it. Um, talks about her, you know, when she was a baby and she 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 had to get her, some of the life from the moon, all that stuff. It, they didn't show it like in the cartoon. There's no flashback. It's just exposition. It's just not not nearly as 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 good. She randomly kissed Asaka in this moment, which the, their relationship did not grow like in the cartoon. It didn't feel warranted. It just not the cartoon did such a better job at growing their relationship over time. I I I'm looking at my bullet points here. And under the good tab, there's absolutely nothing. But the bad tab has quite a bit, so let's go over that. Yue's hair looks absolutely horrible. And this is my daughter, Princess Yue, our tribe's <laughs> There's something I need to tell you. Her wig looks so fake. I'm actually, I can't believe I'm actually gonna do this. I never thought I would. I should probably just jump off this balcony now. I'm gonna compliment the 2010 movie. Yue in the 2010, can you stop with the whistle? Stop with the whistle, thank you. Yue in the 2010 movie actually looked better than this adaptation. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it's true. Yue in the 2010 version looked more like Yue than this version. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it's true. Nothing about Matthew Paco's relationship with Grand Grand was ever mentioned, by the way, in this version. So I don't know why it was taken out. Katara is already a master at this point. Again, not showing you how she got this far or anything like that. She just is a master. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. Yue's arranged marriage was glossed over. Once again, real world issues not being explored. This version didn't talk about that at all. So there's nothing to learn from this or to relate to this at all for real world scenarios, nothing. Yue's relationship with Sokka feels super rushed and not warranted at all. This is the part that I don't understand, right? They took out Sokka's sexism, right? They, they talked about it in the interviews. They took out the sexism, but Paku, Paku in this, has character flaws because he's sexist. He's super sexist in this episode. He talks about how women can't fight, it's not in our traditions, all that stuff. So then it makes me wonder, wait, if you kept Paku, Paku sexism, like in the cartoon, and, and you know, you're know you showing Katara that you know that you know she can overcome this, it's wrong for them to be doing that. Why did you do it to Sokka? If, if, like, if you were afraid of talking about those topics and you took it away from Sokka, why do you still have it here for Paku? It's another, it's an example of the writing just not being consistent and didn't make any sense. And I just don't understand here too. So they already established in this version of the show that Aang can only call upon past avatars when he's at their shrines. It's a limitation, but it's like, whatever, it's a change. Aang was trying to call on Korok for help, but he, Korok's not really helping. Why can't Aang call on other past waterbending avatars? It just, it feels like that whole limitation of he can only call on certain past avatars in front of their shrines. There's no other past avatar shrines in the Northern Water Temple, really? I don't believe that for a second. Again, I just a random change that I feel like it's just a limitation to be a limitation and it didn't really make any sense. Let's go into episode eight, the last episode, and I'll give you guys my overall thoughts here. Iroh talks about, talk, talks to Zuko as he goes for the avatar. In this scene, you know, it, in its own way is still charming but it's not as charming as the original. Because, you know, in the original, Iroh tells Zuko that he thinks of Zuko as his own. Like, I think of you as my own son. And that's super heartwarming and it really hit in the original. But in this one, Zuko just tells Iroh Luten would be proud. And that's not to say that's bad, but I, don't, I just don't think it hits like the original does. So it feels like this change again is, is another downgrade. Katara is asking Paku if she could fight after determining that she doesn't need to ask. You said you're afraid of losing us, and that's why we can't stay by your side. But it's my decision to fight, not Paku's and not yours. I'm here to help. Now is not the time, Katara. Now is exactly the time. I thought I made myself clear. Women are not allowed in combat. I thought I showed you how stupid that is. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. Katara already established that she doesn't even need to ask Paku anymore to fight. She's just going to do it. But in this episode, she is still asking Paku if they can help. So it's like, okay, so you're still looking for, for permission to fight from this super sexist guy. And also they decide to do that in the middle of the war. In the cartoon, they, they got all that stuff out of the way before the Fire Nation was at their doorstep. But here, they're literally already being attacked and that's when Katara decides to do it. And it's like, it's not realistic 
it's bad writing and it's also super cheesy the way they did it they had like a line of all the girl characters out there it just it was very cheesy it didn't hit the way they thought it did it just didn't Zhao learned about the water and moon spirits from the fire temple in this version which makes no sense uh in the original he learned from the library but i don't know if the library is even going to be in this version but he learned from the fire sages that didn't make any sense to me whatsoever momo there's a Momo sacrifice in this episode where they, they trick you into thinking that Momo was going to die. But when you think about it, it was literally just an excuse for Sokka and Yue to go to that spiritual area because they needed to be there for the story to continue. And they had no other way of doing it because in the original, they had Sokka and Yue show Aang where to meditate. But because he doesn't do that in this episode, they just need an excuse for them to be in that location. So they just had Momo do a sacrifice thing, which was, again, very random. And it also goes to show that Momo is doing more than Katara. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. Zuko appears to fight Aang, but Katara decides to fight him and Aang decides to leave her to fight Zuko, which is like, I don't believe that for a second that Aang would actually do that, where he would leave Katara to fight Zuko alone. Uh, Zhao kills the moon in this and Iroh kind of just watched it happen. Climatic. He gets into a position to like attack Zhao, but they still watch him as he like stabs the fish in slow motion. It was so odd, such a weird change. Zuko and, and Zhao fight, and, and you know it's it, it's whatever. And, and that's when Zhao tells Zuko that you know he's just motivation for Azula to be perfect, all that stuff. Iroh killed Zhao rather than the Ocean Spirit taking Zhao, which is like I didn't like that change because I like that the Ocean Spirit kind of got revenge to Zhao for what he did to the to the moon. But in this, just Iroh kills him. Uh, Katara brings back Aang from being the ocean spirit, but it didn't make much sense because in this version, Aang and Katara don't really have much of a relationship or a character development with each other. But in this one, she's talking about how, you know, I need you, Aang. I need you to come back, all this stuff. But also it's it's the fact that they didn't have any time to like grow with each other. So it just, it just fell flat. Yue gives, you know, her life back to the moon. And the father's reaction wasn't as powerful as the original. He, does, he didn't mention how he was proud of his daughter. Uh, the attack on the North was as a distraction for o them the Fire Nation taking over Omashu, apparently the whole time. And it's like, how was that a distraction? What did that, they were already in the North. I don't know how Omashu being attacked would have changed anything. And the comment was mentioned at the very last uh, minute of the episode before the series ended, where they mentioned Susan's comment returning. Almost like they forgot that was the main part of the story in the original, and they just had to tack it on at the last minute there. We have devised a method to better understand celestial motion. No way. There's no way. Y'all's writing is so it's taken shit. Years. We didn't know where to put this in. Time. So I'll talk about the good real quick. Zuko being, you know, Azula's motivation is good, and Aang being emotional after the fight and destruction of the Northern Water Tribe, I think was also good. But they're so much bad. The CGI characters fighting looked horrible. Iroh had no spiritual connections in this show whatsoever. So, you know, they in the original, Iroh had was it, it talked about him being in the spirit world in the past. And they even had a vision of him seeing Aang in the sky on Roku's dragon in the original. But in here, Iroh has no spiritual connection in this show so far. So him caring about the moon spirit in this does it make proper sense like it did in the show? So I'm just giving my overall thoughts so far. If you guys notice, a lot of my problems with the writing literally happened because in this version of the show, they took out the whole thing with Aang needing to be protected in the uh, spirit area, the oasis, uh, while he was in the Avatar State in the original. So there's just a lot of problems that I feel like happened just because of that small change of them not being in the Oasis and him going to the after state then and learning a lot of the backstory there from Cole and all that stuff. Because a lot of stuff got shifted from that. But I'm going to give my overall thoughts now. My main problem with this version of the show is that there's no mystery here. There is zero mystery with this show. They revealed all their cards and character backstories in the first episode. Uh, and I liked that about the original. I liked finding stuff out along with the characters. I liked Aang finding out 
how he's the avatar and and Katara and Sokka finding out that he's the avatar and and uncovering what what this means and all this stuff all of those cards are revealed like in episode one so there's no surprise there whatsoever um the characters constantly narrate their internal thoughts all the time and it's super unrealistic when they do that and it's super bad writing i'll give you an example ang in the first episode before he flies on Appa after being told he's the avatar literally says i need to remember who i am but i know who i am i like to play air ball and eat banana cakes and goof off with my friends that's who i am not someone who can stop the fire nation not someone who can stop a war no kid talks like that no 12 year old kid actually talks like that and narrates out loud their internal thoughts it doesn't make any sense why they did that uh there's no character development whatsoever the character arcs in this are not nearly as well made as the original and it's just like i don't like that whatsoever Sokka is already you know fine he's decent he doesn't have much character flaws whatsoever and Katara is the literal worst she's bland she has nothing going for her she's boring and I hate that. I've gotten good at picking things up quickly. And that's my thoughts really on the show overall. I'm mad because Netflix, you were so close. You had the, for the most part, for the most part, you had the acting, you had the budget, you had the characters, you had the world. The only bad thing that holds you back from the original is the writing, the writer's room. Whoever the writer was for the show honestly should be ashamed because what I love about the show so much is the writing and how they, how well written the show originally was and the characters and this version of it completely crapped all over it. And it feels like such a disrespect to the original writers. And now I know why the original writers left it's because of that. Uh, whoever this writer was did not respect them at all. Did, it missed the point entirely, as you can tell from the Sokka comment. And in the end, it, in the end it's, just, it's just not as good as the original. What can I say? The writing was just not great. So if there is a season two, I really hope they bring the original writers back. And I really hope they do a better job of taking inspiration from the original show's writing. It, I know people have a problem with me saying that, like, oh, you just want it to be just like the original. I don't, but they should take what's in the original, respect it. And if there is changes, the changes need to make sense. The changes so far doesn't make any sense. And that's my main problem with this version of the show. So with that said, do I recommend this version? No, <laughs> like watch the original. All that to say, just watch the original. I didn't like it. I really didn't like it. The writing just didn't do it for me. Uh, and that's really it. The action was nice. Some of the extra stuff is cool. Iroh and Zuko are probably the best part of this show. But outside of that, no, Katara is the worst. Aang is bland and there's no character arcs. Uh, casting is okay and the fighting sequence are cool, but that's about it. That's all I can give it. Alrighty guys, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'm sorry this is super chaotic. I decided to fill this last minute while I'm here. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, and again, I'll see you guys very soon for my next couple videos. So I'll talk to you guys very soon. See you later, procrastinators.